Welcome to Westeros, where the battle is on for the Iron Throne. Where some great families fight for honor. You fight for the Starks, I fight for the Lannisters. The Lannisters, oh God. And others to rule at any cost. It's about power and greed. I won my crown! Your heroes can die any second. As the battle rages to be king or queen, after five seasons, a greater foe has arrived to take them all down. Kill everyone, sit on the Iron Throne, and watch it snow. Season 6 is coming, so let's get you up to speed with the epic storylines in Game of Thrones, the story so far. The storytelling is really, really ancient. When you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. There is no middle ground. As season 1 opens, it's the calm before the storm. King Robert Baratheon rules from the capital, King's Landing, but his days are numbered. To be king in Westeros, you sit on the Iron Throne in King's Landing and you're ruling over the Seven Kingdoms. Start the damn joust before I piss myself! He's locked in a loveless marriage and only chose his queen for her family's name to hold his kingdom together. King Robert has married Cersei Lannister, a member of the hugely powerful behind-the-scenes Lannister family. They're the ones who, if they back you, you're king. Sometimes I don't know what holds it together. Our marriage. Cersei is so smart and, you know, she's just in this awful predicament. This unhappy couple have three golden-haired children to their name. But Cersei keeps a deadly secret from Robert. The children are not his. The truth will be discovered on a royal trip north, and it's here that our story really begins. The king has asked his old ally Ned Stark to help him rule. Ned and his wife Catelyn govern the north, fiercely loyal to the crown. The Starks stand for uh, loyalty, integrity, bravery. They are really the moral compass of the show. They're the good guys, and they're the ones that you find yourself rooting for from the start. The couple have five children, three sons and two daughters, and the decimation of this happy family will reverberate throughout our tale. They're almost too innocent for that world. King Robert arrives with his queen, Cersei, and with them is the whole Lannister clan. That's Jaime Lannister, the queen's twin brother. Would you please shut up? And it's really the Lannisters who are going to introduce a lot of trouble into the life of the Starks from this point. The arrival of the Lannisters into that world totally sends shockwaves through the whole family. Bran Stark goes climbing one day, gets to the top of a tower and discovers the Lannisters' deep, dark secret. The secret is that Cersei, the Queen, is actually sleeping with her brother, Jaime. The Lannisters, oh God! They are... I have never seen a family. I mean, talk about dysfunctional. Stop! Stop! It's incest, which even in Westeros is generally frowned upon. It also means that King Robert's children are not actually his children. It's all right, it's all right. He saw us! I heard you the first time. He knows what it means, too, and he knows that if the incest is discovered, uh, not only will he and his sister be put to death, but the, their three children may very well, too. And so, for Jamie Lannister, the greatest swordsman in Westeros, there's only one solution. The things I do for love. <laughs> Here's a convenient way, the kid'll die, it'll look like he fell, and our kids will be safe. First in a coma, Bran will later awake with no memory of how he fell or what he saw. The royal secret is safe for now, and only the viewer has seen what the Lannisters will do to keep it. The fact that he lives is, is, is almost the catalyst for all the series that go after it. King Robert still wants Ned down in the capital, so this will be the last ever time we see the Stark family all together. A family which includes Ned's son out of wedlock, the bastard Jon Snow. Ned must now leave his family and follow King Robert, taking his daughters Sansa and Arya with him. The reason I think that the first season of Game of Thrones works is it's essentially about this good family that just wants to essentially be left alone and uh, serve their king and their country. This good family is ripped apart and thrown into situations that they never anticipated. They are bound for the capital, King's Landing, where Ned's new task will be to protect King Robert from those who would unseat him. And in season one, viewers learn the greatest enemies live in exile overseas. The Targaryens are a royal family who were ousted from power. Isn't he a gracious host? They were dethroned by King Robert in the last war. The only surviving members of the family are a brother and sister called Viserys and Daenerys. The siblings are the children of the Mad King who was killed in war. Viserys dominates his younger sister. Viserys has more than a touch of the Targaryen madness, and, and you know sometimes he's protecting her, but he's also trying to treat her as a as a bargaining chip. Come forward, my dear. In search of an army, Viserys makes a pact with a savage tribe, the Dothraki, offering his beautiful young sister in marriage to their leader, Khal Drogo. She's the only bargaining chip he has. He doesn't have any wealth anymore. He doesn't have any armies, but he has her, who he can trade to this horse lord. I would let his whole tribe fuck you, or forty thousand men and their horses too, if that's what it took. He's power hungry, but to a nasty degree. Doesn't really care how or by what means. He just wants to be 
important and looked up to. But his plans backfire. Daenerys and Khal Drogo fall in love and become quite the power couple. Suddenly she finds herself with Khal Drogo empowered. People are obeying her. I am your king! Shall we return to the Kalisa, Khaleesi? He finally pushes it too far with the, with the horse tribe. Tell him I want what was bargained for or I'm taking you back. He just completely underestimates not only Danny but Khal Drogo. What's he saying? He says yes. You shall have a golden crown. And then he gets it. Look away, Khaleesi. No. She just has that, like, stoic look on her face. And you're not fit to be king. A crown for a king. Wearing the crown is deadly. His father was the king and he made, met a, a, a grisly end. So it's only appropriate, really, that when he gets his crown, he should die too. He was revolting. He was utterly, utterly revolting. And that was the moment that she escaped from her shell when she became the woman and not the kowtowed girl. And so in season one, it's a now pregnant Daenerys who emerges as a power player with Khal Drogo's backing. I love Daenerys. I love the journey she's gone on. And as the Targaryens grow in power, we learn that King Robert faces another challenge to his northernmost borders. Threats which led past rulers to build this giant wall of ice to keep out wild things beyond. It's protected by the legendary Night's Watch. The Night's Watch are a, a small army who guard the northern border of the country. In season one, there's lots of fighting for the throne, but actually in the background, there are these creatures appearing north of the wall that nobody has seen for thousands of years. And no one quite wants to believe that they're there, but they certainly are. We hear the characters saying that this is all folklore, that this is all made up. But for the viewer, we see that basically these characters do exist. They are there. I think the White Walkers are really terrifying, mostly because you're not 100% sure you know what they're capable of doing or what their motives are. They are a serious threat. But the Night's Watch gets a powerful new member when Ned Stark's bastard son, Jon Snow, feels compelled to make the trek to the Wall to join this ancient order. Everybody has a pilgrimage, has a thing to do, and that is the thing that drives them through the drama. Father, no children. I shall wear no crown. There is no turning back from these vows. Jon and new friend Samuel Tarly forsake everything else for the quest to protect Westeros. Darkness. I am the Watcher on the Walls. I am the shield that guards from the realm of men. The journey is the thing that you're watching, and people take part in it, and their character comes from what they have to do and where they have to go. And that is a, that's a really ancient way of telling stories. But down at the political heart of Westeros, the capital King's Landing, Ned Stark is now mired in intrigue. His daughter, Sansa, sees King Robert's son, Prince Joffrey, as her fairy tale suitor. She's presented with marrying the future king. Live in a beautiful castle, go to banquets, have beautiful dresses to wear, a fairy tale story. You'll be queen someday. It's only fitting you should look the part. But Ned learns the heir is not King Robert's son and makes the mistake of his life, confronting Cersei, Joffrey's mother. My brother's worth a thousand of your friend. Your brother? Or your lover? He's a man of the North, and he doesn't know King's Landing and doesn't really know what it takes to be successful there. When the king returns from his hunt, I'll tell him the truth. You must be gone by then. You and your children. I will not have their blood on my hands. He's just been stuck up in the North too long and has no idea how the real world operates, how to really deal with the kind of the politics of Westeros. Robert's wrath will follow you. And what of my wrath, Lord Stark? Ned has crossed a Lannister, for which he will pay dearly. You then get the biggest shock in season one of Game of Thrones. King Robert Baratheon, murdered by a pig. Ned, he was vulnerable, but that's what happens if you try and be a truthful character in King's Landing. Joffrey is now king, and without Robert to protect him, Ned is tried for treason. He confesses, believing it will save his daughter, but misjudges the new ruler. He's just evil. He's a wicked kid all the time. He's never anything else. Bring me his head. Stop. 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 That's when you realise nobody is safe in this world at all. When I saw Sean Beam pushed down, that was the only scene that really has brought a tear to my eye. It's cruel, it's heartbreaking, but there's a point to the children witnessing this. If they want to survive, they have to start to be resilient. They have to learn from this. It was at that moment you realised what Game of Thrones was really about. 
It's here that the Stark family splinters. Arya is whisked away by a Night's Watch brother loyal to Ned, leaving Sansa at the mercy of Joffrey. And when news reaches Ned's eldest son, Rob Stark, he rallies the North to avenge him. Rob is the heir, and he's not only picking up his father's mantle as Lord of Winterfell, but he's picking up a much older mantle, the crown that no one has worn for 300 years, the Kingdom of the North. It will lead to all-out war between the Starks and the Lannisters, who are led by its patriarch, Tywin Lannister. He is the person who's got the strategic vision for the family. He's the big player, and if you get Tywin Lannister on your side, you're going to get the throne. As well as his twins, Cersei and Jaime, he also has a disappointing third child, Tyrion, who isn't built for battle, but still has to join the war effort. I always thought you were a stunted fool. Perhaps I was wrong. Half wrong? He's the perfect anti-hero. You know, he's not that big, strong mountain who can, you know, defeat people, but he defeats people with his wit and his intelligence. But when Jaime is captured in battle, Tywin is forced to put his faith in Tyrion. You will go to King's Landing. And do what? Will. As Tyrion sets off for King's Landing across the narrow sea, season one ends in triumph for Daenerys Targaryen, but not before she suffers tragedy. She has a short period of being happy, and then Khal Drogo dies. For all your days. They were not given to me to sell. Well, the dragons in themselves are hugely symbolic because they represent power as much as anything else. Centuries back, her Targaryen ancestors conquered Westeros because they controlled the dragons who once lived there. The beasts are long extinct, but all that is about to change. Season one ends with the sight of Daenerys emerging from a fire unscathed with uh, her dragons hatched. These creatures are extraordinary creatures, the likes of which have not been seen in hundreds of years. It's almost like a rebirth, but she's no longer Daenerys Stormborn. She's mother of dragons. Literally. As the dragons are born, she comes more and more to her own until the power becomes innate to her. It's about a new era. The whole first season is essentially the old era dying out and the new era beginning. And by the end, she has a sense that she knows that she's bound for greatness. And so we come to season two, which marks a new reign of tyranny in the capital, King's Landing. Joffrey is brutalizing his subjects, as well as his bride-to-be, Sansa Stark. You can't! What did you say? Joffrey is a miserable kid with absolute power. Take him away. I'll have him killed tomorrow, the fool. He's a bully, and we don't like bullies. Killing you would send your brother a message. <laughs> Sansa has learned uh, some painful lessons along the way. The chivalrous knights and the uh, gallant princes that she dreamed of, she, she got a gallant prince and he turned out to be Joffrey. Leave her face. I like her pretty. She's a prisoner in the worst place imaginable, during all kinds of psychological and sometimes physical abuse from these captors. All our lives are in danger. I had a disgusting lie about Uncle Jamie. And you? He's the product of a brother and sister shagging, so, like, you know, this might be why he isn't all there mentally. What are you asking? I'm asking if he fucked other women when he grew tired of you. How many bastards does he have running... <laughs> Cersei's smart enough to realize that Joffrey is uh, not what she might have hoped for. He's getting out of her control now, and he's a danger in part even to her and even to other members of the family. What you just did is punishable by death. Joffrey's enemies are everywhere. Chief amongst them, and just across the bay at Dragonstone, is Stannis, brother of the late King Robert, who believes the throne should be his. He believes that he's entitled to the throne for reasons which, technically speaking, are perfectly sound. Stannis has learned that Robert's children are Lannister bastards, which means that it is Stannis who is next in line. So Stannis Baratheon, who knows that King Joffrey is a product of incest, decides to send ravens out to all the corners of the Seven Kingdoms, letting them know the Lannister secret. With his eye on the prize, Stannis enlists a red priestess to help him win power. She believes Stannis is the savior of the worlds, basically. He's supposed to be on the Iron Throne. And her magical powers have no limits, I think. There's, there's so much that we don't know that she can do. However, Stannis isn't the only one after the throne. His younger brother, Renly, also believes he has a claim, and so war is inevitable. Whose banner is that? My own. I suppose if we use the same one, the battle would be terribly confusing. When they become competitors for the throne, they become enemies at the same time. The Iron Throne is mine, by right. All those that deny that are my foes. The whole realm denies it from dawn to the wall. They both think they should be king, but I'm on Stannis' side, so screw Renly. Rather than fight it out on the battlefield, Stannis finds another way to kill his brother. His family ties don't mean an awful lot in Westeros. The powerful sorcery of the Red Priestess is revealed when she gives birth to a sinister weapon. The Shadow Baby is basically just a way to kill Renly, and it comes out of me in a great way. 
What I think is brilliant about Game of Thrones is it lives in a fantasy world. It's a completely realistic depiction of how power works, what power does to people, what people do to get power, and what happens when they fall short, when they miss the mark. And that's why it's so brilliant. <laughs> When Renly is murdered, it leaves behind his widow, Marjorie Tyrell, uh, who belongs to uh, the Tyrell family, who are very rich and powerful in their own right. Calling yourself king doesn't make you one. And if Renly wasn't a king, I wasn't a queen. Marjorie is an absolute piece of work. You know, she wants power. Do you want to be a queen? No. I want to be the queen. Across the narrow sea, Daenerys Targaryen is learning valuable lessons in her quest to return to Westeros and seize the throne. She is desperate to be a good ruler, that she can, you know, go to bed at night saying, I think I'm doing things the right way. Welcome to Carth, my lady. Things don't go quite to plan when she accepts the hospitality of the wrong people. She makes strong, powerful decisions, but often those decisions have consequences and side effects that aren't good. And this looks like it might be a costly decision when the rulers of Carth steal her dragons and sentence her to eternal imprisonment. They miss their mother. They want to be with you. Do you want to be with them? You will be. When she's in Carth, everybody just kind of thinks, oh, who are you? We'll just take your dragons. We'll take your dragons and you're not powerful anymore. But this is Game of Thrones. And instead, Daenerys shows exactly what she and her baby dragons are capable of. Dracarys. <laughs> People have underestimated her the whole way. And it is in season two that we finally see the dragons kill for Daenerys. As Daenerys' power grows in exile, back at the Wall, Jon Snow and the Night's Watch are called to defend against another growing menace beyond the border, the Wildlings. Their various tribes have united and are marching south. Jon infiltrates their ranks and comes face to face with the full scale of their massed forces. So this is where we realise that the Wildling army came together and united, and so the threat is very real uh, of, of the Wildlings, and Jon Snow realises this and decides to join them. Game of Thrones is really good about revealing mysteries slowly to you. Things are always kind of fed to you in little bite sizes. Three blasts. Run! <laughs> and with the White Walkers, it's the same. You only get a little tiny taster every season of where we're going. And season two is where we discover the full horror of the threat that these icy killers pose. They can play the Game of Thrones all they like down there in the King's Landing, but an army of, of you know, ostensibly zombies and these White Walkers is heading their way to, you know, destroy the world. We have all these kingdoms wanting to fight for the throne, and they think that that is what ultimately the battle is about. But really, at the end of the day, they're not looking at what's the real problem here, and it's the White Walkers. Convinced the Iron Throne should be his, Stannis Baratheon attacks King Joffrey's army at Blackwater Bay. With Stannis' army hammering at the gates, an unlikely hero steps up. I'll leave the attack! Joffrey's uncle, Tyrion Lannister, bravely leads the defence of the city. He's sort of the heart of the story, because he's one of the few people who can step back and see everything that's going on, and that's because of his position as an outsider that comes from him having a disability. Having the imp as an heroic character, A, is a brilliant piece of plotting, but it also draws attention to what we expect from heroes. There's our brave men knocking at our door. Let's go kill them. Tyrion manages to get the troops fired up by giving uh, a good speech and then heads out with them to fight Stannis on the bay. He doesn't last very long. He gets knocked out after a couple of minutes. But Tyrion is upstaged by his father, Tywin, who arrives with his own massive army, bolstered by the Tyrells, who've now firmly joined the cause. Tywin Lannister is one of the great warriors uh, and battle uh, strategists of the age. The battle is over. We have won. <laughs> it's that moment where you really see where power lies. It's not in the king. It's in the person behind the king. And so season two ends with the Lannisters victorious. But as season three begins, Daenerys Targaryen is on a warpath and heading to Slaver's Bay. She and her dragons may have grown in power and stature, but securing an army still eludes her, so she ventures to a place where she can buy one. She knows she needs an army, a powerful army, to, if she ever wants to reclaim the Westerosi throne. And the best bet for that uh, are the Unsullied. They will stand until they drop. Who are incredible warriors, obedient warriors. They may suit my needs. Tell me of their training. Danny's code is very much anti-slavery. She knows what it's like to be bought and sold. So she ends up doing it on her terms. I have dragons. I'll give you one. 
She seems to have made this daft agreement to give away her best dragon. I actually say to her, you know, you won't win a war with slaves, but you will with dragons. Go Agedis! But she shows she's outgrown her mentors. I really love the fact that she had hidden her talent for Valyrian. Once she knows that she's got the Unsullied on her side, then it's very easy to say to the dragon, who still will listen to her and not to him, burn him. Dracaris. She's saying to them, you're now free men. She's been the mother of dragons, and you knew she was destined for greatness, but now she really is a queen with an army. And it's like, on top of this, she's got these fire-breathing, mythical creatures that are just going to tear shit up. Impressive, yes, but 8,000 followers is not enough. Daenerys knows she'll need to win more followers before she can embark upon her ultimate mission, to journey home to Westeros and claim the Iron Throne. Where, in the capital, King's Landing, the Lannister family are the power behind the throne, pulling the strings of the boy king, Joffrey Baratheon. Joffrey's ditched Sansa and is now betrothed to Marjorie Tyrell, a reward for the Tyrell's military support at Blackwater. I imagine it must be so exciting to squeeze your finger here and watch something die over there. Marjorie Tyrell is uh, learning how to manage the very volatile king. The Tyrells are a great family with rich, fertile lands in the West, considered by most as a force for good. Speak freely, child. They're still cunning and skilled at the game, with their eye on the throne, an enemy within. He's a monster. Olena is the matriarch of the family. Oh. And she advises her granddaughter on how best to play the political game so that she might take power in King's Landing. Oh, we thank you for the truth. As Marjorie enchants Joffrey, Cersei's influence wanes. She's increasingly isolated. Her brother Jaime is still missing, a prisoner of war out in the Riverlands, guarded by Brienne of Tarth. Brienne of Tarth, I think she's, yeah, she's, she's, I like her best. <laughs> but when the two are both captured by a northern faction, they're both in danger, and Jaime finds he must play protector. This is all bundled up in when Jaime begins to start thinking about other people. Oh, you're making it worse. His efforts to stop Brienne being raped are, are, are the beginning of that. You know who she is, don't you? It's good when those little bits of goodness come in those characters that are so devilish as well. Just to give you a little light in there. Lord Selwyn would pay his daughter's weight in sapphires if she's returned to him. I mean, of course, it being Game of Thrones, it doesn't get him anywhere. <laughs> Another one of those Game of Thrones moments, which has so much more going on in it than just, just him losing his hand. He's the greatest swordsman in, the, in, in Westeros, we're told, so he can't do that anymore. Yet without his hand, we see Jaime Lannister at his most heroic. The heartless knight who pushed Bran Stark from the tower finds new honour in season three. He'd secured an escape route back to King's Landing, but found he could not abandon Brienne. He's left, he's left her behind, and he's on his way to King's Landing. Then the, the, his captors mention that what's going to happen to her and then he decides to return and save her. And this newfound chivalry means the Lannisters must do without Jaime behind the Iron Throne a while longer. And it is in season three that we witness the fearsome work of another powerful family, the Boltons, who are scheming to take control of the North. I think the Boltons want pretty much what everyone else seems to want, is power and status. Kill me! You're no good to me, dead. We need you. Ramsay, a bastard son of the family, enjoys torturing his enemies, including Theon Greyjoy, who he took prisoner when sacking Winterfell after Ned's demise. I think, historically, the Boltons have always been just, just under the Starks, kind of the Starks have always been on top of them, so I think they feel that now is their time to rise. You don't look like a Theon Greyjoy anymore. It's unbelievable what Ramsay's capable of doing to people. Reek. Reek! That's a good name for you. Completely mutilated him, um, broke his will entirely and turned him basically into a subservient sort of wreck called Reek. Another hostage at large in season three is Arya Stark, kidnapped by the Hound. The disgraced knight plans to find Arya's family and traitor for cash. Remember what happens to children who run. One of the great double acts of Game of Thrones is the Hound and Arya. Need a hand? Hound's a really interesting character because you, don't, you never really know what you feel about him. I mean, he's ghastly. <laughs> She is this elfin character with this tiny little sword, and you just think she's never going to survive. There's something so uh, perversely magical about that pairing, sort of warped mentor-protege relationship that develops. In order to survive in that world, you've got to match um, what is given you. 
In his desire to claim a ransom, the Hound heads for the Twins, where he knows that Arya's mother and brother, Catelyn and Rob Stark, are attending a wedding. Arya and her captor believe they're both about to get what they most desire, to reunite a child with her mother. They're both so very wrong. The Twins is a strategic river crossing controlled by the Frey family, and the Starks need them on side for their war effort. Walder Frey is a very bitter, nasty old man who controls a small but significant area in the kingdom. I was pledged to marry one of you and I broke that vow. Rob's come to make peace. After failing to marry one of Walder Frey's daughters, the Stark family offer Rob's uncle to make amends and are here for that wedding. A terrible mistake. Catelyn, in her heart, knew that you do not break a promise if you are the King of the North and also you certainly don't break it to Walder Frey. The moment where Cat sees that Roose Bolton is wearing chainmail is a powerful moment. Even though I'd read the scripts, the Red Wedding still completely was shocking, and I was still screaming at the TV, don't do it, no, don't, don't. You just don't want this to happen. The Red Wedding is the event that pretty much decimates an entire generation of the Stark family. Such a shock. <laughs> I'm almost spits the bed still. The Lannisters send their regards. It is an ambush relished by Walder Frey, and we learn backed by Tywin Lannister. Rob is such an amazing character, I think you kind of want him to be the king and to win. It's the cruelty of it, and it's the relishing of it. Following the brutal slaughter of the Starks at the Red Wedding, Arya Stark arrives at the Twins to witness her brother's desecrated body and loses any last shred of innocence. She learns to become stronger and fight, and also she's after revenge. And when she comes across her family's killers later, oh, shit. she matches their brutality. <laughs> And so, by the end of season three, all the Elder Starks have gone from the Game of Thrones. Only the children remain, orphaned and scattered across Westeros, including Bran Stark, still paralysed from his fall. He's fled Winterfell with a loyal band of followers heading north. It's all right. The walls will protect him. Bran Stark is very much on his own journey to discover the root of this ancient magic that's reappearing in the kingdom throughout the seasons. And yet, amid the slaughter and loss in season three, comes a huge breakthrough in the fight against the White Walkers. Unlikely hero Samuel Tarly stumbles on their weakness. You stay back! From the moment we meet Sam, he says, I'm, I'm a coward, I'm a craven, I'm the guy who runs away and cries. Samuel reaches for all he has to hand, an old dragon glass spear he once found in the ground, and it kills the White Walker. <laughs> To his astonishment, it, it, it works. The spells are shattered and it's, it's melting before him. So, as season three ends with a splinter of hope, a King's Landing season four begins with an apparent celebration. A royal wedding unites two of the great houses of Westeros, the Tyrells and the Lannisters. Marjorie and Joffrey's wedding is one of those weddings that we all have to go to where there's no love in the room. The wedding brings another great family into the game, the Martells, represented by Prince Oberyn. They might not want the Iron Throne yet, but they want to take the Lannisters down. He's ostensibly in King's Landing because he wants to attend the royal wedding. In actual fact, he's there to get revenge on the Lannisters. Tell your father I'm here. And tell him the Lannisters are the only ones who pay their debts. Joffrey really uses the wedding as an excuse to be as horrible as he can. Uncle, he can be my cupbearer. He sees it as an opportunity to wield his power because he can. And you're dying for something to happen to him. He's choking! I'm the poor boy! And so, when an unseen hand poisons the newlywed king... Idiots, help your king! Wait! It's the moment of retribution that the whole of the Seven Kingdoms have been waiting for. I think everybody who watches Game of Thrones was hoping this day would come. <laughs> I wanted to kill him in such a way that the viewers were reminded that here's a 13-year-old boy who's dying. Though it is actually the Tyrells that have poisoned Joffrey, it is Tyrion who is blamed. And this is really the point where Tyrion's fragile bonds with his family begin to unravel. Take him! Take him! Take him! In plot terms, the death of Joffrey is another shaking of the board where the pieces are scattered. And also, it's one of those things that elevates the whole series from merely a story into a saga. And that saga continues when the news from Westeros reaches Marine, where Daenerys has conquered the city with her growing army. King Joffrey Baratheon is dead. Murdered at his own wedding.
This would appear to be a really good time for her to finally make her play for the Iron Throne. But actually, she has new responsibilities now, and she has unfinished business where she is, and she's still trying to learn how to rule. And to compound matters, her dragons have grown so big that Daenerys has started to lose control of them. Everyone loves a dragon. I think they're getting more impressive every season. As they get bigger, as her power increases, the harder it is for her to manage. And that's where the story then has to go. All they're going to bring is complexity. And when one of the dragons kills a child and abandons her, Daenerys is left with no other choice but to chain the other two. She's just locked up her dragons, so can she unleash them again? And will they forgive her? Without the mighty force of her dragons, Daenerys is faced with a dilemma as to what to do next. The challenge to her is, at what point am I or will I be ready to go back to Westeros to claim the throne? How can I rule seven kingdoms? if I can't control Slaver's Bay. She's definitely going through a sort of a dark night of the soul, I think, where she's trying to determine, have I got what it takes? And so in season four, Daenerys decides to stay in Marine and learn first how to rule before she attempts to invade Westeros. And the resulting chaos of Joffrey's death also has a huge effect on the Stark children. Sansa manages to flee King's Landing and make her way to the Eyrie to take refuge with her aunt Lysa. Her escape is masterminded by arch-schemer Littlefinger, a shadowy figure behind many plots in Game of Thrones. Littlefinger is playing a very chaotic game, and he thrives on that. All my sweet life. <laughs> and to gain control of powerful lands, he marries Sansa's aunt, and once she's served her purpose, he disposes of her. For Littlefinger, it's all about getting power, I think, and using Lysa as a pawn along the way. <laughs> Sansa is witness to this crime and has to decide where her allegiances lie. Sansa's one of these poor characters who's been mistreated all through the series. She's seen a lot of horrible, horrible things happen, and she's never been able to take control, and this is the first time that actually she's got nothing else to lose. When Sansa lied to protect Littlefinger, I cheered. I thought, thank God, girl. And she tried to reason with her, promised her she was the only one he had ever loved, but she stepped through those doors and she was... What you discover is that she's been learning this entire time. She's been listening. She's been watching. She's been taking Littlefinger's lessons to heart. So from one Stark protege to another, Sansa's sister Arya is still the Hound's hostage, but they're now on an equal footing. Who would pass the bloody gate? The bloody Hound, Sandor Clegane. And his travelling companion. Arya Stark. He's her captor, but he's also her protector. And, you know, she's seen his own pain and his own fear at times, and they've shared some dangerous situations. The relationship is finally tested after the Hound battles with Brienne, and he's left mortally wounded. Arya is forced to strike out on her own, but not before the Hound's young charge must decide whether he lives or dies. Fuck it. I'm ready. Now he's wounded and he's dying, and she's remembering all he said about mercy, and he's asking for mercy, and by mercy he means a, you know, a quick thrust to kill him. And she doesn't give it to him. Kill me. They've changed each other through their experience together. Kill me! But sadly, what it means is in this moment, she won't put him out of his misery. She won't give him the easy way out. She's going to leave him there to suffer. Also changing is Arya's brother Bran. Now north of the Wall, he's acquired mystical powers, including the art of mind control, known as warging. I have to say that the sins that we filmed um, with him warging into Hodor, they're, they're my favourite sins. I think Bran's powers will continue to develop, and he'll almost be like a force of nature. I, I think the throne will be irrelevant to him by the time he's finished his sort of growth of his powers. And so by the end of season four, Bran has made it to the end of his quest, where he discovers just what the future holds. You're going to help me walk again? You'll never walk again. But you will fly. At the wall, the Night's Watch suffers a huge wildling attack at Castle Black. But in season four, they get a powerful new ally. Stannis Baratheon, who's been away licking his wounds after the Blackwater defeat, joins them with his vast army. He emerges as a huge contender uh, for the throne at the end of season four when he liberates Castle Black. <laughs> Stannis realizes that going for King's Landing was not the right course. The Battle of the Blackwater was a huge and crushing defeat at the end of season two, and it's taken them basically two seasons to sort of rebuild from that. And his arrival means that Jon Snow could have a new ally in the battle against the White Walkers beyond the Wall. Your yeah, Grace. If my father had seen the things that I've seen, he'd also tell you to burn the dead before nightfall. 
All of them. Seeing him paired with Jon Snow and that storyline um, is going to have huge ramifications in season five. I'm guilty of being a dwarf. You're not on trial for being a dwarf. Oh, yes, I am. I've been on trial for that my entire life. He's put on trial for a murder he doesn't commit. His father deserts him and betrays him. I demand a trial by combat. I mean, trial by combat, you can get someone to fight for your honor. So whether you're wrong or not, as long as they win the fight, that's what matters. He names Oberyn Martell as his champion. Oberyn was a new character in the season, incredibly charismatic. Everyone rooted for him. You just thought he was going to win. But when Oberyn is defeated, Tyrion is sentenced to death. In Westeros, the pursuit of justice is as futile as anything else. Oh, get on with it, you son of a whore. Is that any way to speak about her mother? Tyrion is released from jail by his brother Jaime and told to go and board a ship and run away. Instead, he decides to check in on his father, Tywin. My nine. Tyrion then kills Shay in a sort of fit of jealousy and then uh, takes a crossbow and goes to find his father. Tyrion. Put down the crossbow. It's so tightly wound, this scene, because Tyrion's obviously, he's at the end of his rope. What's brilliant about him, he's so well portrayed, you can see yourself doing this. We'll go back to my chambers and speak with some dignity. I can't go back there. She's in there. What, are you afraid of a dead whore? <laughs> this is someone who spent his whole life trying to win his approbation. As much as he hated him, he really wanted that, you know. Obviously, that's never going to happen now, because he put a crossbow bolt in his groin. <laughs> You're no son of mine. I am your son. I have always been your son. What it means is when a big character like that goes, there's going to be a power vacuum, and there's going to be uh, hustling and jostling to get into his place. And so we come to season five. After killing his father, Tyrion has fled across the narrow sea to Pentos, a fugitive on the run. He was a Lannister, and he had all the money in the world, and a, a, a noble name and a big bag of gold can buy you a lot. All that's gone now. His name is a death sentence. He's totally at the mercy of the people he's traveling with. Who are you? And then the unthinkable happens. I am the gift. He is captured and handed over to his family's greatest enemy, the Targaryen queen-in-waiting, Daenerys. My name is Tyrion Lannister. Tyrion was in danger, not least because, you know, his brother killed her dad. But rather than execute him... I'm not going to kill you. ..she sees Tyrion's potential value. No. Banish me? No. So if I'm not going to be murdered and I'm not going to be banished... You're going to advise me. She knows that you can't just win the Game of Thrones by strength and power and goodness. You've got to connive. And between them, they are uh, an extraordinary force. Meanwhile, in King's Landing, after sending Jaime to Dawn to bring back their daughter, Cersei is left vulnerable. Her son, Tommen, is now king and has fallen under the spell of his new queen, Marjorie, much to Cersei's dismay. I think Tommen loves Marjorie, as in, like, a, a husband should, but Marjorie, as much as she cares about Tommen, it's more about her being queen. Mother! Welcome. Marjorie's just a, an absolute master at manipulation. What's the proper way to address you now? Queen Mother or Dowager Queen? Like, she knows exactly how to play people, and she's so adept at it that nobody ever notices that she's doing it, apart from Cersei, who is a manipulator herself. Like, she knows exactly what she's up to. Judging from the King's enthusiasm, the Queen Mother will be a Queen Grandmother soon. Wouldn't that be a lovely day? While Cersei and Marjorie fight over the king, up at Castle Black, his uncle Stannis is still lusting after the throne. In order to take it, he must first liberate Winterfell and tries to enlist the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, Jon Snow. You know who rules at Winterfell now? Who's Bolton? The traitor who plunged a dagger in Robb Stark's heart. Don't you want to avenge him? Jon has always had a, an incredible amount of integrity and honour. All my life, I wanted to be Jon Stark. Say the word and you will be. But I have to refuse you. It's exemplified when he denies Stannis. I'm Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. My place is here. He just wants to protect everyone around him and help, whereas other people, Lannisters, Baratheons, they just want one thing, and that's power. So as Jon Snow remains behind to defend the wall, Stannis strikes out for Winterfell. He's going after something, and it is, it, it's increasingly futile. In a desperate move, Stannis follows the advice of the Red Priestess, who promises him victory if he makes an unspeakable offering to the Lord of Light. That's one of the most chilling scenes, I think, of season five, when, when he burns his child. Melisandre really thought that Stannis would be the one, and, you know, she's put a lot of her heart and soul and everything else into, into helping him. 
But it proves to be his undoing. His men desert him, and Melisandre, realising all is lost, flees to Castle Black. Great. Leaving Stannis to advance to Winterfell on his own. Speak up. Can't be worse than mutiny. Because he wants power, he ends up losing everything. And awaiting Stannis at Winterfell are the Boltons, who try to cement their position in the North with a tactical marriage to Sansa Stark. God, poor Sansa Stark. She's been through so much. May I introduce my son? Ramsay Bolton. Now that the Boltons have kind of established themselves at Winterfell, there's a huge proportion of the North that's still very loyal to the Starks. So bringing in a Stark will um, really solidify their position in the North. Master manipulator Littlefinger has concocted a plan to marry Sansa to Ramsay Bolton to take them down from within. Sansa, she's surrounded by these evil people that just want power, and she's just there in the middle, being tossed about between them. So Sansa marries Ramsay. We take this man. But it's a huge miscalculation that traps her in another brutal relationship. We care about her innocence, her purity, and after all this time of trying to protect that, suddenly it's gone by the most, the most despicable person that we know at this point. Oh, no, no, no. You stay here, Reek. You watch. Fellow prisoner Theon Greyjoy, a.k.a. Reek, is too terrified to help. I think we all thought he should have stepped in on the wedding night, let's be frank. With Ramsay distracted by battle... You're leaving it to me. Sansa is caught attempting to escape, and it's only then that Reek finds the courage to become Theon again. <laughs> Theon had to stand up and finally stop being Reek and finally take back some power, and that, I think, will lead to a really exciting season six. They've jumped the wall, but um, where are they going to go? As Sansa and Theon leap from the walls of Winterfell, nearby Stannis is facing defeat by the vast Bolton army. I think Stannis had given up. I think even before they'd gone into battle, I think he was going there to die. He knew he was beat. He was wounded. His army had been done for. Fate finally catches up with Stannis when he comes face to face with Brienne of Tarth, who sought vengeance for Renly's death since season two. Well, there's women fighting for him. When Brienne turned up, it was he, he just knew. You know, he was kind of like, I'm done. I'm Brienne of Tarth. I was Kingsguard to Renly Baratheon. I think that's a very satisfying moment because that finishes the circle of her loyalty to Renly. I was there when he was murdered by a shadow with your face. And it was just like, do your duty. It was like, there's no more to be said. But as Stannis Baratheon bows out of the Game of Thrones, new players show their powerful hand. They needed the wildlings on side, and it was only Jon Snow that could, that could really see that. This alliance is sacrilege to his men, as free folk are the sworn enemy. But Jon believes only unity will defeat the White Walkers. And, right on cue, the deadly foe arrives. What's so great about the whole White Walker mythology is the way it has been building throughout the series. And it's now that viewers witness one of the greatest battles in Game of Thrones, as White Walkers launch a huge attack with their army of the dead. It's a game-changer. I think it's a group of characters and an army that's really going to shake everything up and make it very interesting. Jon Snow has an unexpected victory. His Valerian sword can take down this deadly foe. And it's that moment of realisation that Longclaw, his sword, that Valerian steel can kill White Walkers. His victory is clocked by the White Walkers' mysterious leader, the Night's King. I don't think the White Walkers are afraid of anything. I think fear is um, just not in their vocabulary. And then John and the viewers see the Night's King reveal that he has a greater power. He can raise and recruit the dead. It's a challenge to John, and uh, look what I can do. So their motivation, the White Walkers, is to kill as many as possible because then their ranks swell. And it's John realizing that how serious the plight is that we're not going to be able to fight these guys, Valerian Steel or not. And while ice power is unveiled in the north, in Meereen, Daenerys comes into her full firepower. Protect your queen! She is facing a civil rebellion, ambushed by insurgents who want to bring back slavery. And you think, she's done for. How on earth? But there's a little bit of you going, but she's also a dragon somewhere. And Daenerys is saved by the return of her greatest weapon, Drogon. The symbol of the Targaryens coming to claim their power is on the back of a dragon, because, I mean, there's not much you can do when you're standing on the ground and a dragon's coming at you. She's 
had the dragon snow for quite a long time, but her actually becoming a dragon rider, that's her claiming her birth, right? More than I think anything else we've seen her do, because that is how the Targaryens wielded their power. Vla. And how they were able to rule the Seven Kingdoms for so long. And you can see it in her face, right? Like as soon as she's on that dragon, this is where I'm supposed to be. You know, she swammed off on the back of Drogon and left Missande, Tyrion, Varys and Jorah and Grey Worm to deal with this political mess in Marine. It could be the making or the breaking of Tyrion. Yet as season five ends, Drogon appears to deliver Daenerys to an uncertain fate. The last thing we see of Daenerys season five, she's surrounded by Dothraki, it's back where she bloody started. <laughs> And season five is one of vengeance for Arya. The young Stark follows her mentor to Bravos to become an assassin. To serve well, the girl must become no one. Arya's relationship with Jacken is fascinating. He is utterly mysterious, um, and she is seduced by his power. I didn't come here to sweep floors. No? Why come then? You said I could be your apprentice. The power of death, the power to choose who dies. She is supposed to forget her past, but then an old enemy arrives. She withstood a whipping from him. She was in disguise. She led him in to her trap. Arya slaughters Meryn Trant, a name on her kill list of people who've destroyed her world. Arya, I think, has crossed the line. There is a sense of vengeance rather than a, a sense of justice. She's just slowly ticking off the list. But Jacken deals rough justice to his wayward apprentice, and for Arya, the season ends in darkness. She took the eyes of Meryn Trant, so he then took her eyes. What's happening? And season five builds to a finale of brutal justice for royalty too, as a new religious power takes hold in King's Landing. Cersei empowers religious fanatics to help her topple her rival, Queen Marjorie. I can't do this. I am the queen. She brings back the Faith Militant because she's like, well, hopefully I can clear the board with these guys and regain some of my power. The young King Tommen is too green to intervene. He has the power to stop everything that's going on, but he's not a politician, he's just a decent boy. He's a little boy. He's scared. But Cersei's engineered her own downfall. Royalty is no longer above the law and fanatics come for her next. Move. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a gamble and in this one instance, she loses badly. <laughs> Cersei and all of the lords are going to realize there's another contender uh, to power in Westeros, and it's, it's religion, it's the power of the faith. They want to remove all the excesses, to strip Cersei of all her finery, and encourage her, in inverted commas, to become clean. A sinner comes before you. Watching Cersei do the Walk of Atonement, something happened that I thought would never happen, and that is I felt compassion. No matter what she'd done, Previously, she didn't deserve this. And so season five sees her left naked before her subjects to atone for her infidelities. The walk of shame was tough, was very, very tough for her. Very, very few women could have done what she did, complete that walk. And you see her trying to maintain this regal presence, but she can't, and especially when we reach the Red Keep and I'm stopped and she carries on. But waiting for Cersei is a new giant of an ally. The strange creation that is her new knight. That's kind of what I love about Cersei, is that no matter how broken she gets and no matter how defeated she thinks she is, she can always gather herself. And she's just got this brilliant like, look of determination that you just see come over. I want to see what happens to Cersei next. I really do. I want to see her come back from that walk of shame. But it's up at Castle Black, in the final minutes of season five, that viewers witness the cruelest blow of all in a gut-churning finale. Lord Commander, it's one of the wildlings you brought back. Says he knows your Uncle Benjen. Says he's still alive. Are you sure he's talking about Benjen? Said he was First Ranger. Angered by Jon's peace deal with the wildlings, the Night's Watch lure Jon to his death. I think Jon Snow did something very brave and very bold and very, well, radical, really. But he knows that it's the right thing to do. When I saw the cross with traitor written on him, I thought, oh, no, this isn't going to happen, is it? I thought, no. They're not going to kill him. And then they did. For the watch. You don't expect Jon Snow, who's been a beacon of nobility and pride and goodness throughout for the watch, to be killed in such a sort of savage, brutal way. For the watch. He's a hero of the whole show. He's a symbolic hero. You root for him. 
But the great thing about Game of Thrones is your heroes can die at any second. Joining the betrayal, the squire he has mentored. For the watch. You get to know characters five years, and then he just, he's gone. You don't get up from that unless spooky old Red Witch does something to him. And we don't want, we don't want tinkering with Jon Snow, do we? It's obviously what everyone wants to know, don't they? You know, I understand that. I don't know, or do I? And so season five ends with betrayal and loss, begging the question, who will fight for good in season six with its new struggle for vengeance and power? <laughs>